want you to join me tonight in the book of Jude, and we're going to look at verse number five, the book of Jude, verse number five. Today, while getting ready for the service this evening, and uh, I was reading over a lot of different things, trying to find the mind of the Lord, and and uh, I just feel like the Lord led me in a certain direction. I don't want to imply that I'm going to share anything that you've never heard this evening, probably not going to share anything you've never heard me say, but I just feel like the Lord wants to speak something to our heart. Amen. But the book of Jude and verse number five, Jude says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. What a, what a frightening passage of Scripture for Jude. And this is an alarming passage, all of that. But when you read the first several verses of Jude, there's just such a, an awakening. It's a trumpet sounding of sorts. He said, I, wanna, I just want to remind you, you once knew this, but I want to remind you, life has crowded a few things out, but I just need to remind you that the Lord saved some people out of the land of Egypt. But afterward, he destroyed them, not all of them, but he destroyed them that believed not. And tonight, I want to just talk for a little while about embracing the promises. Amen. Embracing the promises. The Lord has made promises to us individually. The Lord has made promises to our families. But the Lord has also made promises to our church. Amen. He's made those promises not just to me or not just through me, but he's made those promises to you. Amen. I want to talk about that a little while. God bless you and you can be seated. This passage of scripture refers to the children of Israel and, and of course, it's their journey out of Egypt. Uh, God was really once again trying to bless his people, but he staggered and struggled at being able to bless them because of their unbelief. This was God in the Old Testament, not a different God, but we're reading about God in the Old Testament. But we see that same common thread find its way all the way into the New Testament in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about he did not many miracles because of unbelief. Imagine that. In some places, he's raising the dead, opening blinded eyes, deaf ears, the lame are walking, and, and the list goes on and on. Yet in other places, he did not many miracles. And there was one key element to that, and it was unbelief. They could not embrace or pull together into their heart and mind the truth of what God was wanting to do for them. And, and I, I, I know tonight, as long as I'm talking about the children of Israel, and as I'm, long as I'm talking about the unbelievers in the New Testament, you're going to be just really at peace, and you're just going to be so glad you come to church tonight. But when we really boil all this down, this applies to every one of us. Because sometimes the Lord can't do many miracles in our life because of our unbelief. Because we fail to embrace the promises of God. And so few truths, I think, are more articulately told in Scripture than, than God's real desire to bless humankind. He wants to bless His creation. So entire passages of Scripture reveal to us His intent to impart His blessings and, and um, 
But everybody that God desires to bless doesn't get blessed. Amen. Because we build that wall of unbelief. We think, well, you know, we know the Lord can do certain things, but he just does that over there. He does that for someone else. And, and we can hear about revivals in other parts of the country or in other countries or in even other parts of our state and think, well, you know, that's there. That's them. And, uh, but yet there's this unbelief that it could ever happen in our own lives. But we have to press through that. We, we must press through that. Amen. We need the truth of God's word to save us. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul said that he would not have us be ignorant. That's what Paul said. We shouldn't be ignorant of the, of the value of what God is wanting to do in our life. And then he proceeded to give us a summary of the afflictions of Israel. And so Paul in, in 1 Corinthians kind of reaches back and he talks about the children of Israel. He speaks about the time between Egypt's bondage and Canaan's promise. There's this, this interim between. And he reminded us in 1 Corinthians 10 that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. In other words, the glory of God was above them all in a cloud and that they all walked across uh, bodies of water, the Red Sea, the Jordan River on dry ground. Following their deliverance, the Bible uh, talked about the deliverance. I preached about it, I believe, on Father's Day. Uh, the deliverance of the blood of the lamb that was spread across the lintel and the doorpost of their home. Following that deliverance, they were supernaturally, miraculously delivered from the Egyptians. And they walked across. They got out of there Amen. The Lord had delivered them. But then he continues to say, Paul says, they did all eat the same spiritual meat and they did all drink the same spiritual drink. I think it's important to remember that manna fell from heaven. Manna means what is it? It was the hand of God, that miraculous loaf that God provided for the children of Israel every day. Every morning it was there fresh, six days a week. And then on the sixth day, there was enough for two days for them to go through the Sabbath. They never wanted for bread. They also never wanted for water because the Bible says that the water flowed from a rock and it followed them. Now, the, the scripture says that they all drank from that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now, how that worked, the scripture's silent about how that actually worked. We never may never fully know that, but we do know that just like they had manna when they needed it, they had water when they needed it. God was a provider. So in the midst of this wonderful deliverance, and not that they were just being delivered, but every day there was a daily miraculous reminder, a daily manifestation that God was with us. God is with us. When they picked up all the manna they needed, the rest of it withered away through the heat of the sun. But the next day, it was there again. Everything that they needed. Everything that they needed. So there was a miraculous manifestation of the presence of God every day. And in the midst of all of that, we are still surprised to read what Paul said in verse number 5. 1 Corinthians 10 and 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Overthrown in the wilderness. Then we are told, it's a warning, that the Lord says these are given to us as an example. So we need to look at that and consider carefully that we too do not fall prey and become lost or overthrown in the things of life. They had managed to come out of many things. The blood had been shed and applied. And so they were delivered from that. They came out of Egypt. They were miraculously sustained. But yet the scripture says many were overthrown. They managed to come out of Egypt, but they failed to step in the promises that God had provided for them. And I think that is so important for all of us to understand is that you can't just step out of a sinful life. You've got to step into a godly life. Because if not, you're just going to be in a vacuum somewhere and you're going to be sure prey for the enemy. So it's not enough to just separate yourself from sin. We've got to join ourselves to the Lord. And, and allow him to manifest something in our heart and in our lives. They failed to step into the promises of God. They were covered by the blood. 
spared from the sword. They lived under that cloud that miraculously took them out of bondage and they came through the sea. Despite all of that, the scripture talks about this remnant that died in the desert because the Bible says they were overthrown in the wilderness. And so just a brief look reveals to us several things I think worth noting They were not overthrown by the elements around them and they were certainly not overthrown by their enemies. But after their deliverance, many of them perished before reaching the promise and perished before reaching Canaan, overthrown in the wilderness because they could not stretch their minds wide enough to believe that God would fulfill the promise for them. It's so easy to believe for others. We're going to come right now where we all live now. We can believe so readily for others. We can pray with great faith for others. But when it comes to us, I want to tell you, I believe God can do anything for you. But when it comes time for me, I want to put myself in a different line. And you're the same. I'm just using me as an illustration so I don't offend you. Amen. We, we believe that the Lord can do anything for someone else, but we struggle to think that God would bless our family or that he would bless us in some certain way. When I talk about blessings, I'm not just talking about monetary blessings. I'm just talking about his favor being upon our lives. They couldn't stretch their minds wide enough to believe and embrace what God really had in store for them. It's hard to imagine, really hard to imagine. However, if we take into consideration that they had centuries of slavery, centuries of slavery had diminished their faith and it had diminished their faith to the point that the promises of God were just almost beyond their grasp. And I will tell you that sometimes life can really whittle away at you. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Life can just whittle away at us. They staggered at the promises to use a biblical term. They staggered at the promises of God. The book of Hebrews tells us that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. Now, Hebrews 3 and 12 is a warning. Here we are warned to take heed lest there be in any of us an evil heart of unbelief. That's a curious way, uh, really a curious way to say that. but, But the writer says that we need to take heed lest there be in any of us An evil heart of unbelief. That sounds kind of wicked, but let me explain that. An evil heart of unbelief doesn't necessarily manifest itself with evil thoughts. But an evil heart of unbelief, if we could put this in a modern setting, would be probably more akin to just a spirit of complacency. And so let's read that differently. Take heed lest there be in any of us a spirit, an evil spirit of complacency that we would just sort of think we can put this in neutral and coast and it doesn't really matter. You know, some people have the idea that if I leave the devil alone, he'll leave me alone. That's not how it works. He doesn't play fair. He doesn't have a rule book. And so we think, well, I don't want to pray too much. That's just going to stir up the enemy. I promise you the enemy is stirred up already. Anybody that's trying to do right and get away from wrong, the enemy is stirred up. Amen. And so there's a promise for you. And I'm asking you tonight to embrace that promise that God has for you and he has for your family. He wants to do that. Amen. Sometimes complacency is, is, is almost unnoticeable, hard to detect sometimes. It can be camouflaged by, by comments and ideas or philosophies that, well, we know that God can do anything. We believe that, but I'm just not sure he can do that with me or he can do that for me, or I'm not sure he can do that here, there, but not necessarily here. And so we got to learn to detect within ourselves that evil heart of unbelief when I think, well, I'm just going to be complacent. I don't want to be complacent. I want to be fervent and lean in and say what the Lord has promised, I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to stand on the word of God. Amen. So we got to learn how to detect that in us. And sometimes we may need to surround ourselves with the right people that can help us detect that. Some of these people were overthrown by their inability to wrap their heart and their mind around the full promises of God. Again, I mentioned a moment ago, but four centuries plus of slavery had had whittled away at them like cynicism and circumstances can whittle away at us. Amen. I will ask you tonight not to raise your hand, but we've all been cynical at times. I'm not talking about one time. 
We've gone through seasons of cynicism when we just had to kind of snap out of it and just say, I need you to help me, Lord. We can become critical because circumstances of life can just, they can jar you. They can taint you. They can twist and turn the lens of life out of focus and we can become cynical and critical. But I pray that the Lord would help me to open my eyes and wake up and realize nothing is too hard for God. And so when I feel cynical or critical about my situation, I want to say, Lord, I know what you have the ability to do and I'm just going to hold on to that. I pray that God would just let us wake up to that reality. He said, if we ask, It'll be given. If we knock, he'll open. If we seek, we'll find. If we believe, it's going to be there. And so I'm thankful to God. He is saying, I want you to be proactive. I want you to be the one asking, knocking, and seeking. Amen. I don't know what your concept of God is, but I pray that we would all realize that what God has done before, he can do again. And what God has done for others, he will do for me. I understand. It seems like I'm repeating myself tonight, and I am. I'm being very intentional because I want to get this across to all of us, and I want it to begin in my heart, that what God has done in the past, he can do again. It is so easy sometimes for us to think about maybe a move of God or a season of where God was moving in the past, and and turn and look longingly back there and believe that somehow if we could just get back there, that's where God is. But the kingdom of the Lord is not static. The kingdom of God is dynamic. The kingdom of God is not locked in the 60s. It's not locked in the 70s. It's a move of God is not locked somewhere in the 40s or the 50s. Amen. The move of God is here today. Everywhere present God is is moving. And so I'm going to tell you that what God has done before, God hasn't changed. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't change his mind. His love, his fervor, his compassion or his passion for us has not waned. And what God has done for others, he can do for you and he can do that for me. We got to look at ourselves. Amen. This is not a feel good, a be happy message. Amen. I'm just telling you tonight in Jesus' name that what God has done, he can do again. And what he's done for others, he can do for us. Yes, he can. It's his desire to heal. He, it's his desire to save. It's his desire to bless. Every parent in this house understands. Every influencer in this house understands the huge blessing that comes with giving something to somebody that you really love. A wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to be able to bless someone with something else. And so if we feel that way in our own flesh, how much more do you think God enjoys being able to pour his blessings and promises out on us? So we must never forget that we are the children of Abraham. And so we need to realize that. What does that mean to us in this setting we need to remember that Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strong in the faith and he gave glory unto God. The Bible says of Abraham that he was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to do. Now I want us to understand something tonight and I realize I'm casting a pretty big net here. We're reaching from a lot of different places in scripture, but it was one thing for Abraham to come out of Ur of Chaldees in Genesis 11. That was one thing. Thank you, Abraham, for coming out. Thank you for taking a few steps in the right direction. But this is not the end of the story. That's what we read about in Genesis 11 toward the end of that. They are out of the land of Ur of Chaldees. They come to a place. It's just a midpoint, but they stop there. But it was there that God spoke again. And he said, you got to come out and you got to move forward. And in Genesis 12, Abraham began to move. He began to move at the word of God. He had to leave his father behind. He had to leave his flesh behind because he had to step into the promises of God. It's one thing to come out of Ur of Chaldees, but it's something else to believe that God was going to do all the things that he said he was going to do. The Lord said, I'm going to give you children. How am I going to have children? I'm an old man. How am I? How is something like Isaac going to come out of this old body? And how is it going to come out of Sarah's barren womb? But somehow the Bible says this about Abraham that he staggered not at the promises of God. 
I don't think Abraham was supernatural. I don't think Abraham was made out of something that's not what we're made out of. I believe the same blood that coursed through his veins is the same blood that's coursing through our veins. He had the opportunity to doubt. He had the opportunity to believe, but the Bible says that he staggered not at the promises of God. I wonder tonight if I could have somebody that would just say, I'm not gonna stagger at the things that God has told me. I know it seems like an impossibility and it seems like I am here and the promise is there, but I am gonna hold on to the unchanging hand of God. Hallelujah. Somehow he staggered not. The writer of Hebrews added this about him. In Hebrews 11 and 8, the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Here's why. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham, ladies and gentlemen, was on a mission. Abraham, I know when we say he looked for it, he didn't know which way he was going. Please hear me tonight. Abraham wasn't a babbling fool. He wasn't trying to stand and lick his finger to figure out. He just didn't know exactly what, but he was was a man on a mission. I'm looking for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. And so I say tonight to you and I, I want to begin with me and then I want to you to hear it tonight. Amen. I don't want to get overthrown in my ability to wrap my mind around God's promises. I know what he said. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to relish in it when I'm praying and I can feel it reassured and I'm going to hold on to it even tighter when I'm praying and I can't see any hope of it. I can't feel any signs of it, but I'm going to say, Lord, you said, I believe, I believe, I believe. Praise God. The book of Numbers is, is uh, in the book of Numbers is one perhaps a, a peculiar tale. It's a passage I've referenced many times through the years. After centuries of struggle and, and decades of wondering, the conquest of Canaan was before them. Israel was, was standing in, in, in the truest sense of the word. Israel is standing on the cusp of their promise. They're at the border. They're at the threshold. They're trying to cross the last frontier before entering into their blessings. When all of a sudden, it seems at least in scripture, all of a sudden out of nowhere there is this most odd petition that is made. After generations of walking, generations of wondering, generations of waiting, two and a half of the tribes, two and a half of the 12 tribes of Israel, Reuben, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and a half tribe of Manasseh said to Joshua, who was their leader, they get to the edge of the promise. They're, they're there. They've made it. All they got to do is claim it. They said, we have flocks and families, and this land is good for both. Where we're standing is good enough. So let us build pens for our flocks and houses and our families, and we're just going to stay here on the edge of the promise rather than risk the crossing. We're not content. Or, or we're, rather, we're just content to end the journey here. They're, they're just standing there at Jordan's River. I know that it's easy for us outside of that context to say, you're right there, but we need to understand that there was a formidable foe in front of them, but they were serving a big God. Amen. And for just a moment, Joshua must have stood in stunned silence. What do you mean? <laughs> we've been, we've, you know, the old song says, we come this far by faith. What do you mean you're stopping now? What do you mean this is good enough? What, what do you mean this is sufficient for the day? He reminded them how their fathers had fallen in the desert. How, however, their minds were made up and they just said, no, right here at the edge of the promise, that's good enough. And it seems to them that the promises of God were too good to be true. Now, I would love to tell you that that's where the story ends, that you know, two and a half tribes stayed out and everybody moved on and things ended well. It's kind of like a Hallmark movie. 
But that's not how the story ends. If you want to know the final fallout of this failure to possess the promises, we have to fast forward. We have to, we have to jump to the New Testament, to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And we have to watch him as he passes over to the land of the Gadarenes in Luke chapter 8. And when he steps out of the boat and into that land, he's standing on the same soil that was so enticing to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. What seemed so hospitable and perfect, what seemed like the very, the very place we ought to just call it ours. But you see, when he got there, he didn't find flocks or families, really. He found Satan. He found swine. He found a demonic man crying and cutting himself. So a place that once seemed safe and enchanting, a place that once seemed like this is good enough, now, now has nothing to offer. And the tragic truth of that today is this, that there is a high price to be paid for coming to the edge of something, but failing to enter into the promises, the full promises of God. There are other generations that are going to pay the price for our complacency and other generations will pay the price for the things that we failed to, to get them and, 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 to, and to pull down. I pray that God would somehow help us to realize that, that there's nothing too hard for God. And if he did it once, he'll do it again. You know, uh, this is not informative, but I live just like you and face the same difficulties and discouragements as anybody else. But I, I, I do feel at times that spirit of those four lepers that, that said, why sit we here till we die? Right. Yeah. I mean, the lepers that said, we can't just, we can't just stop. Right. We, we can't just call it quits now. I mean, there, there's another reality just as real as our own. And, and I just say, Lord, I'm going to believe you. I believe you. I believe that we can have peace that passes all understanding despite the climate around us. I know... We're living, in a, uh, we're living in a strange hour. I don't have to tell you this. There, our, our nation is just one snap of your fingers away from a civil war. And it very well could have happened just a few days ago. There's just a shaking and a trembling that is in our world. But I believe that we can have peace in these uncertain times. Peace in these turbulent times. I don't want to let circumstances of Satan or self shrink my heart. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16 and 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. God is looking for somebody to pour his blessings out. In other words, God is wanting to bless. And so I'm asking the Lord to help us today. I'm going to ask our musicians, if you will, to come. Amen. God is looking for somebody, a candidate. And our problem is one or maybe more of these things. Sometimes our heart's not right with him. The lack of real dedication or consecration, the lack of prayer, the lack of real commitment. And God is, is bound because we won't just commit ourselves. Or maybe we have trouble believing. Sometimes we, I've met people who, who just really believed that they didn't deserve anything more. They were kind of in the prison of their own mind that this is enough. But let me be clear tonight about something. I don't think our righteousness uh, merits any of God's blessings or any of his miracles, but I don't believe that, that our unrighteousness, unrighteousness can, can forfeit what God is wanting to do in our heart if we will turn toward him. Some people can say, well, I've just done too much. No, you just turn around and see what God can do in your life. Just turn around and see what God could do with your hands, with your mind, with your mouth. Sometimes we're afraid to ask God to bless us because we just feel, I, I don't deserve it. Well, I, I want to tell you, I'm in that same line. I don't deserve the blessings of God. It's what he wants to give. It's what he wants to do. And so I want to focus on what the word of the Lord says. He said if we'll ask and seek and knock and believe. And so I ask the Lord to work on us. I'll ask you to stand. All through the word of God, we find miracles. We find healings. We find deliverance from enemies or we find deliverance from sin or captivity. And you can read it yourself. It's there. That God moved again and again and again and again. One man asked the Lord just... 
Let the sun stand still. One man said, Lord, I know these may seem random to you, arbitrary. There's certainly context for this. But one man said, Lord, don't let it rain for three and a half years. One man stood at a Red Sea and didn't know what to do. And the Lord said, what is that in your hand? Just stretch it out and see what happens. To another, he said, we are in another body of water. We don't know what to do. He said, just pick up that ark. And when the soles of the feet of the priest touch that water, it's going to part. And that was so. We see God again and again and again and again. Amen. Fire from heaven. Calming storms. Taking a little widow's mill barrel and oil. Blessing it. Amen. I'm not convinced that oil was running over. I'm not convinced that the meal was spilling out on the floor. But I am convinced that every time she dipped her hand there, there was sufficient for the day. Sufficient for the day. Sufficient for the day. Amen. We see the Lord feeding multitudes, turning water to wine, all kind of miraculous things. If he did it once, he can do it again. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I say, Lord, deliver us from that evil heart of unbelief. Deliver us from complacency and let us embrace the promises of God. Amen. Would you just join me in prayer this evening? Can we pray and ask the Lord to touch us and strengthen us right now in the name of the Lord? We believe you.